and we are finishing up with one of our most exciting presentations this year um, that really fits in alignment with our big initiative of the Prenatal to Five um, initiative that we kicked off with a summit about a year ago. And we're thinking a lot about all of the different dimensions that contribute to children and families' well-being. And we're thinking a whole lot about equity and justice as we look at thriving for all of the children and families in Wisconsin and beyond. And so we're excited to dig into the physical health and environmental context for development um, with a wonderful panel. I think we could spend a couple of hours with each of these presenters, which we don't have. We have until 1.30. So we're going to have very brief presentations from each person, and then we'll have some time for discussion amongst the panel and questions that each of you have. Um, and then we will be following up with all of you, so please sign in if you have not done so already. We were looking for suggestions for how we want to focus our seminar series um, next academic year. So first, we have Dr. Susan Davidson presenting. Um, she practices maternal fetal medicine at St. Mary's Hospital Medical Center and also holds appointments as a clinical associate professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Family Practice at UW-Madison. She founded the Maternal Fetal Medicine Clinic at St. Mary's and she, because she recognized that their birth center program was incomplete without expanded services for women with adverse pregnancies. She also helped plan the Dean and St. Mary's Women and Children's Comprehensive Clinical oh. Center, providing coordinated and holistic health care for women and children throughout their lifespan. She's spoken across Wisconsin on obstetrical issues, and her experience in high-risk obstetrics has led to her passion for understanding how environmental impacts affect pregnancy. She's a member of the Council on Birth Defect Prevention and Surveillance for Wisconsin, which is charged with making recommendations to the Department of Health Services regarding the Wisconsin Birth Defects Registry. So join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Susan Davidson. Thank you. So, very, very nice to be here. And it's certainly a different audience than I usually speak to. I usually speak to medical groups, doctors, nurses. Can you hear me okay? Is this good? So I'm going to take you a little bit of a, on a journey about how I got here. So we're going to talk about why what we eat, breathe, and touch really matters. Um, I have an email if you're interested and contact me further. I can tell you for sure I have no financial <laughs> So my, sorry about this, I know this is lunchtime, but so my interest in this grew from seeing this. Now, what is this? This is a baby. This baby's going to be okay, so don't, don't be too worried. But this is a baby whose bowel is supposed to be on the inside and it's on the outside. And this is a key condition called gastrospecies. And what it is, is that during development, there's a little hole in the belly right here in the abdominal wall, and the bowel, instead of staying inside, comes outside and floats freely in the amniotic fluid. You can see this is unmistakable. Um, and it's also supposed to be fairly rare. There's, it's about one in 10,000. So um, I grew up in New York City. I got as far as from Brooklyn to the Bronx from, for our college, medical school, and residency. And then I moved to Wisconsin in 1986. And um, when I was in my residency in New York, we saw one of these in the four years that I was there. And we were so confused, we didn't know what to do. So we admitted the patient to the hospital, which is not what you would do now. This is a pregnant mom. Um, I got to Wisconsin and I started seeing a lot of this, like at any time in my practice there were maybe three patients who actually had this. So with, um, with an incidence of one in 10,000, I'm like, this is very, very strange. Um, so I, um, and so I, you know, I was a city kid, I was like, you know, this is 1986, I was like, oh, it must be something in the grab water, honestly not having any idea of what I was saying. Hmm. Um, so then I went to my annual meeting sometime later, and this paper was presented. And what this paper showed was that the closer you live to a center of atrazine exposure, the higher your likelihood of having a child with gastroschisis. <coughs> atrazine is an herbicide. It is widely used in corn and soybeans. Wisconsin is full of it, but we regulate it somewhat. It's not nearly as regulated in our neighboring states of Illinois and in Iowa, in Indiana, which if you look at the National Natural Atrogen Fund, it's like really stands out. So, um, and this, this finding has been disputed somewhat, but it's the, it's the best we have. 
So, like, really, maybe it is something in the groundwater. Um, then the next thing that happened is I read this book. Um, this book is by Sandra, Sandra Steinberger, who is a journalist, and it's called Having Faith, but this has nothing to do with religion. This has to do with, she was pregnant with her daughter, and she's an ecological journalist, and she said, well, how does the environment impact me? Now, she got into this because she had bladder cancer at the age of 26, and so did her dad, and so did her uncle. However, she was adopted. Mm -hmm. So it turns out she lived downstream from a dry cleaning plant, mm. and the, analyte, the, the, the chemicals in the dry cleaning plant um, that made her, contributed to her having cancer. So she turned her, lens, her scientific lens to journalism and, um, and, and the environment. So I'm going to circle back to this in a minute, but let me just tell you that the reason, the, how I got into this whole thing is I started asking questions about, whoa, wow, I'm seeing a lot of birth defects, and they seem to be coming, I have a referral practice, I do ultrasound and genetics, and my referral practice is all southern Wisconsin and then southeast, southwest Wisconsin, so over Plotville, Dodgeville, Richland Center, Cuba City, all the way down to the, to the Galena border, sort of. So um, I was like, well, you know, it seems like I have a lot from this area. What do we know about this? So I started asking about the birth defects registry. And it turns out that Wisconsin had a very, very poorly run birth defects registry that was written into legislation. And like any, unlike any other state in the union, you had to get parental permission to report the address. So there was a sort of general reporting, but you had no way of knowing if you had one person once, twice, never. You, you had no way of tracking these things. So then I started asking, well, well, what's with this? And it turns out that the council that was supervising the registry hadn't met in six years. So I started making a lot of noise, and we'll get back to the noise. We'll have on with that later. Um, OK, so then I started thinking about this even more. So I'm very rabid about the issue of the environment and health, but I'm also turned out to be a very enthusiastic grandma. <laughs> and um, so I started thinking about, like, what are, what, what are, what, I, what is what I do about? So I, it's really, you know, as obstetricians, we're like, oh, the baby has good APGAR scores, we're good, we're good. And then we turn it off to the pediatrician, who then takes care of the, of the child, but somehow there's not any kind of link between the obstetrician and the pediatrician, <coughs> and then our future citizens. So I started thinking, you know, what, what I'm really about is making citizens for the future. And having these citizens really have their best life. Because you know what? He's going to have children someday. And if he has his best life, his children are going to have his best life. So whatever we do, so I started feeling really important. Like, oh, wow, we have traditions. are really, you know, we have to do with the future here. So um, it sort of broadens the scope of what we're thinking about. So um, so what goes into the, into the fetus? And everybody's going to talk about all these things. This is what this panel is about. Well, we have our gene expression. Um, which sort of is a bit of a blueprint, but it's not as much of a blueprint as we think. I mean, we have the revolution in genetics, and you can send away for Ancestry.com, and you can send away for 23andMe, and you can send away for a lot of things. But, you know, even things that, like Huntington's Korea, which is a dominant mutation, where if you have that, you are going to get it, but you know what? Your environment and the rest of what happens to you influences when you're going to get it, how badly, what it's going to look like. So, Genes are not 100% deterministic, and then most things are very, very malleable by the environment. We clearly have our social environment that, that contributes, and I'm talking about fetal and child development. I'm not even, I'm not talking, you know, I'm talking very early. Um, and our social environment is really our socioeconomic environment. So what happens to women who are stressed during pregnancy, who are food insecure, who are not, who are economically insecure, who who don't have a place to live, or is domestic, domestic violence, they are in a state of chronic stress, and they are running on chronic cortisol. And you know what? Their fetuses are running on chronic cortisol, and their children are. And your brain development is happening then. So if your brain development is happening at a time when they're being with stress hormones, you're going to be very, very different than somebody who's been able to go to Lamaze classes and, you know, worry about whether they're eating enough salad. It's going to be a very different experience. And everything, these arrows go up and down, so everything <coughs> modulates everything else. So your genes are going to be influenced by that social environment. Then how's your diet and your nutrition? Do you have enough micronutrients? Do you have enough macronutrients? How's your folic acid? How's your DHA? Um, and finally, what are we exposed to? What do we live in? 
all the all the environmental um, exposures that we have. So, um, and then these are this is basically the same thing, but it says, it says like our, our DNA and our, our gene expression is actually modulated by all these things, and these things last for life. These these changes, epigenetic changes, and they even last the next generation. So this is really a lifespan issue. So, all right. So then, while I was waiting for this council on, re on birth defects to um, reconvene, I got obsessed with like other things having to do with the environment and health. So, so what I learned is that our chemical production in the U.S. has increased almost 25 fold since 1945, since World War II. So we are bathed in chemicals. There are roughly 82,000 chemicals or something that we're exposed to, and there are about 30,000 pounds of chemicals made per person per year in the United States. So this is a very, very big number. And what do we know about them? Not much. So let me tell you the end of the story, which is if you think anybody's watching the story, they are not. So we know very, very little about acute toxicities, environmental faith, ecotoxicity, um, mutotoxicity, meaning the ability to change our DNA, um, reproductive toxicity, very, very few of these chemicals do we have a complete set of data. But some of the things we know are um, what, what are we exposed to. So this is the NHAN data, National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. It's yep. run by the feds, and you probably hear about it from other, other sources on this panel here. And what it does is it looks at our, our habits and our health, and it surveys people. So this is a survey of pregnant women and what they are fi find in their blood. Okay, so 100% of pregnant women have phthalates in their blood. These are plasticizers. These are um, in water bottles and makeup. And um, they're very volatile, so all the fragrances. So if you walk into Bath and Body Works, you're having like a bath of, of phthalates. They give smell, they give artificial... <laughs> Um, fragrance them. They also are endocrine disruptors, they're estrogenizers, they um, make us, this literature they make us fat. They, um, men's <coughs> accounts have gone from an average of 300,000 to something like 120 million. 300 million to 120 million over the last 40 years and it's felt <coughs> that um, phthalates are responsible for this. So these are major things. Okay. These are found in 100% of the, of the blood of pregnant women. Next one up is polycystic aromatic hydrocarbons. These are the products of burning organic matter and coal. These are carcinogens. These have a little birth weight. 100% of pregnant women have this. Um, next is PDBE. Guess what that is? Flavotards. 100% um, of pregnant women. Next up, organochlorine pesticides, 100% of pregnant women. Next up, heavy metals, arsenic, things like that, 100% of pregnant women. And the only one that's not in 100% that's in most women, but not all, is protein, which is by product of smoking, which they can smoke. So that's what's in the pregnant women. We used to think that the placenta <coughs> guarded was a protective environment, but it is not. So this is, they tested babies newborns for chemicals, tested for 413 chemicals, 200 were detected in the average baby, these are carcinogens, developmental toxins, neurodevelopmental toxins, etc. So in, 19, in 2010, the President's Council on Cancer um, had a statement in their um, report, our babies are born pre-polluted. Okay, and the roots of exposure are many. I talked about in utero. Now, we know that the, the um, uterus does not protect as anyone. Um, the placenta does not protect as anyone. Has anyone heard of DES? Mm -hmm. So DES was a, an estrogen we used to give to women. We thought, oh, it's just a different kind of estrogen. It's going to prevent mis miscarriages. Well, guess what? Their daughters later on had weird cancers. They had miscarriages. The men had fertility issues. Way later on. Um, there was a drug called thalidomide that also looked very benign. And it turns out, and we gave it a tranquilizer. It turns out that babies who were supposed to thalidomide were missing arms and things like that did nothing to the mothers. And I'm just going to tell you a quick off-road story. 
We didn't have a big problem with this in the United States because it's scientists named Francis Kennedy and the FDA said this doesn't really look good and let's not let it in. And, she, and this person got a lot of backlash, but she was the first woman scientist in the FDA and she only got hired because they didn't realize that Francis was a woman. <laughs> and when she showed her for the FDA, they were like, ah! Oh, and they, and they, you know, but they had to keep her. So Francis Kennedy is one of my heroes. So there are heroines. Uh, so there are critical periods of life, you know, the, of developmental life. Now these critical periods are when there is active cell division. So some critical periods are fetal and neonatal life and childhood, and really fetal life and childhood are, are continuations of the same developmental process. Puberty, again, when the cells are rapidly dividing, there are growth parts, sexual um, differentiation and maturation, and pregnancy. Um, I'm going to spend just a tiny bit of time on this slide because I think our other speakers are going to talk about this. But this is the distribution of IQ scores. We know that's so normally distributed with a unit of 100. And, and this is the very, very end. So we have gifted and challenged to the top the, and the bottom, 2.5%. So this is the distribution of what happens if you expose children to lead. And what happens is the whole curve moves over to the left, to the left. So you have more challenged people and less gifted people. And you have less, less gifted people to take care of the challenged people. The whole curve is over. It's not that you're harming just a few people. You're, 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 you're moving everything over. The entire population is different. So how many, um, just take a guess, how many children in Wisconsin, what percentage do you think are low poisoned? Exactly right. 5%. <laughs> that is a lot of kids. That's 1 in 20 kids. Is lead poisoning. And I'm just going to take a minute and um, talk about some general principles and then come back to lead. The reason this kind of research is very, very hard to do is because there's a big latency between your exposure and your effect. So if you're looking at somebody who has infertility when they're 30, how are you going to know what they're exposed to in utero? This is really hard to do. So we really don't know a lot about these kinds of exposures and what happens in utero. And frankly, if I were an assistant professor and trying to like make my name on this, you'd have to you'd be ancient because you've never published much. So it's very, very hard. And not only that, that was a very long time, an awful lot of life happens in between. Um, we talked about the when um, windows of vulnerability. Um, I'm gonna go to the last one that these effects of the environmental toxins are not linear. So it's not necessarily that, one, that four times is worse than two, because often they're curvilinear, or low doses are worse because at high doses the cells are killed, or at low doses they're altered. So it's another reason it's very hard to study. And finally, as we go uh, with increased um, understanding, our idea of what's um, safe false. So this is lead. In 1960, we, we tolerated 60. Our safe, quote, safe level was 60. In the 70, it was 30. In 85, it was 20. In 1991, it was five. It was 10. And in 2012, to now, it's 5. Now, this is what we call safe, but there, the way this is calculated is this is the level at which 97.5% of the population is below. This has nothing to do with safe. This just has to do with we're willing to tolerate 2.5% of our population being above this, um, this level. And it turns out that we're not supposed to have lead in our blood, ever. That it's toxic at any level. It's worse the, the higher you go. It, it is sort of linear to a point. But we're saying it's safe, but we're not. We're saying this is what we're willing to accept. But there is no, the current thinking is two, and the very, very current thinking is not. Because lead comes from dirt, and that's from lead gasoline, it comes from pay chips, it comes from manufacturing, it comes from um, pottery, sometimes born from other places, use lead glazes, things like that. You're not supposed to have lead in your blood. Okay, so I'm going to skip over to just some regulatory things. So how, who's watching the shop? So on the left is how drugs come into the market. You develop a drug, it goes through animal testing, human testing, phase one, two, and three clinical trials, enters the marketplace, it's watched, and there's hotlines that you call if your patient has a problem, and then there's post-marketing surveillance. On the right is what was controlled by TSCA, 
Toxic Substances Control Act, 1974. You bring a chemical into the market, it goes into your schools, your workplace, your life, and then it's only um, evaluated if somebody makes a complaint. Very, very different. So, in 2016, an addition to TASCA was signed, the Frank R. Lattenberg Chemical Safety Act for the 21st Century. This is a bipartisan bill. Um, and um, it was very mixed in the environmental community. Some people said, this is good, it's going to move us ahead at least a little bit, and others said, this really is going to lock us in and not be a good thing. Um, and I'm just going to call out a few things about this bill. Basically, 25 chemicals get studied over a very, very long period of time, and then, you know, and then legislation would be introduced to limit them. So it's a very, very long, slow process. One of the criticisms was that states can't take a tougher stand than the feds. So like, California banned flame retardants. So the companies are not going to make separate couches for California, they make it for the whole country. So if a big state like California bans ban something, we're all going to benefit. You can't do that under, task, under the current TASCA. Um, so that's called state preemption. The total funding is $25 million annually. That is nothing for a federal program. You can barely do anything for that. Um, and it doesn't affect, it doesn't like assess if you've been exposed, the interaction between all these um, chemicals is not assessed at all. The biggest problem we're having now is that it's all in the um, implementation and just because the law doesn't mean it ever gets done and in the current um, political environment nothing is really happening. It's, um, and what's happening is subject to a lot of criticism that we can talk about offline later. So, I'm just going to say, you can put, I put in health professionals, what I am, activist, concerned citizen, whatever, what are we going to do? So Albert Einstein, we always go back to, says those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. Um, and there's something called the precautionary principle. And what that says is, if you think there might be a problem, and it has to do with humans, don't wait for, like, P is less than 0 0.05. What level of risk are you really willing to take with your children and yourself? And it may be that if they're just sort of, you know, this is suspicious, maybe you just hold off. Be, be cautious. And this is what they adopted in the European Union. So somehow they managed to farm without the gallons of pesticides and they feed their population. There are many, many um, chemicals that are made in, in Switzerland that are not marketed in the EU at all and that are marketed to us. And, developing countries and things like that. So um, so um, I think just sort of this other way of looking at it um, is very important. We can educate ourselves to engage in health promoting behaviors. And this is just like a little example. They took kids and they um, put them on organic. They, they figured out what they liked to eat and they bought the same peanut butter and the same fruits and organic and not organic and they looked at pesticides in their urine and even that brief intervention um, affected the kids. I don't know if any of you have heard of the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. You can get this easily online. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of um, economic challenges to eating well. And, um, and so you, you, you do have to prioritize. And frankly, what I tell my patients is the biggest thing I tell them is to not eat fast food. Um, and it's a, a paper just came out recently on phthalates. And... If you eat in restaurants, you have much more down exposure because of the way the food is packaged. It's all this plastic around every hamburger and things like that. So the first intervention is eat fast. Don't eat fast food. Cook at home with ingredients that look like ingredients. So like a potato and a chicken and then things like that. And then you can refine by that. But that is your biggest intervention. Um, there's a lot of practical advice. Do they get handouts? Do they get handouts from this? We can okay, I have a lot of different kinds of very practical advice. Um, but ultimately, um, oh, and let me just say the University of California in San Francisco has a wonderful program on reproductive health and the environment and a great website. So you can go there for, um, for um, further information. They put out this handout that we give to our patients. Um, um, I just put this in because I, this is the VA Children's Center. So who thinks this, this little fence is keeping the pesticides out of the children's center? Mm -hmm. um, it's just sort of the ironies of life, you know. 
because we're tobacco free, <laughs> pesticides everywhere. And then finally, we can't we can't put everything on the individual. It's, you can't you know you can't say it's your fault because you're full of chemicals. It is not. This is a societal responsibility. We really have to hold our industries and our government accountable. So my conclusion, after being a doctor for a lot of years, is that it's really important to become a policy monarch. Um, so a group of us got together when we chipped away at this birth defects thing, and we got together with the March of Dimes, and in October of 2017, we got the registry um, changed. So um, in five years, some graduate student is going to have a great project when we have more information. Um, and it was just really the effort of just hanging in there and, and making a lot of noise. Um, that's the registry. Um, a colleague of mine was very active on the Leading in Mud Act, and um, that had to do with cities giving grants to individual consumer, um, houses to replace their lead lines. Wisconsin Manufacturing and Commerce was against it. It passed, and that was, again, citizens' efforts really helped. And then I'm going to point out one last thing. This is the public health budgets for the states as of 2014. And if you look, Wisconsin is number 45. We spent $13 per person on public health. New York spent $105 per person on public health. This is a fine Wisconsin tradition under Democrats and Republicans. It's a nonpartisan shame. Um, so just to be aware. And finally, I'm um, on the steering committee of the, sorry, commercial break. <laughs> I'm on the steering committee of a group called Wisconsin Environmental Health Network, which is a little group that sits around a kitchen table where we put on conferences, we lobby, we teach. And so if anybody's interested in that, um, get in touch with me. And so, John Muir, our great environmentalist who grew up in Port of Wisconsin, says when we try to pick anything out by itself, we find a pitch to everyone else and everything else in the universe. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sweet. Davidson. Next up, we have our own Janine mm -hmm. Dilworth Bart, who's an associate professor here in the School of Human Ecology, where she's the chair of the Department of Human Development and Family Studies. She earned her bachelor's in psychology from Hampton University, a historically black university in Hampton, Virginia, and she earned her doctorate in psychology with a clinical emphasis in 2001 at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. And I met her when we were at the Prevention Research Center at Penn State University, where she did postdoctoral training. Um, her scholarship revolves around how early developmental contexts help or hinder children's development into competent, productive members of society. She addresses this broad issue on how parents and co-parents, parenting behaviors, and the social and physical impact self-regulation, development, and school readiness. Um, so please join me in welcoming Janine Dilworth Bart. So I'm going to try not to use my notes. Um, but uh, so um, we all heard about what happened in Flint, right? We're all familiar with the lead crisis that occurred in Flint, and actually the slow rolling environmental catastrophe that really is an intergenerational catastrophe, we're just seeing the beginning of that. So um, for those of you who may not have heard, um, what happened in the city of Flint is Flint used to have its um, contract um, uh, for water uh, using municipal, municipal water from Detroit. And in a cost saving move, uh, the state decided that, well, no, we'll get our water from the Flint River. Um, and lo and behold, that water was undrinkable. This is actual water um, that was coming out of people's faucets. It looks nice and chewy. Um, and so that people were drinking. And so also, something to keep in mind about the crisis in Flint, it is, it's an inherently racialized catastrophe. Um, and so to deny that is sort of to deny the reality of environmental exposures today. The people who are most likely to be exposed and be unable to remove themselves from the exposure um, are people, are children who are poor and who are ethnic minority. And so this is an inherently racialized situation um, that is faced, that's faced in communities of color. Um, so is anybody familiar with this? <laughs> it's the seal of the state of Wisconsin. 
So lead's been a problem for a long time, even though uh, Flint just brought it to our attention again. Um, we've actually known that lead has been bad for people for about a thousand years, maybe a little bit longer. Um, so there's a lot of data replicated multiple times over a millennia that lead is bad. But lead is also a part of our state culture. Um, so if you look at our seal, anybody familiar with this? Michelle. Anybody know what those are? Those are lead pigs. Do you know what a lead pig is? So one of the industries, anybody know what a lead pig is? So one of the industries of the state is lead mining. So lead is actually sort of encoded into mm. our state government and our state history. That it was one of the sources of, of uh, it was an economic driver uh, for the state, um, as are various industries. So lead pigs, so the miners would go down, this is our miner, our min the miners would go down in the mine and they would bring up lead in these things that they call pigs, maybe up and down a little bit, and then um, the miners would go home all dusty and covered in lead and um, they would be exposed, their children would be exposed. So lead has been um, an issue in Wisconsin since there was a state of Wisconsin. Um, so it's a legacy pollutant. And so as we learned um, from Dr. Davidson's presentation, there is no safe blood lead level. Um, that five micrograms per deciliter um, is new as of 2012. Um, it is uh, according to the NHANES data. And then there's also an issue of the sensitivity of our measurements. And so some of that could be, well, can we really measure reliably below five? Um, and so lead is associated with numerous, and I only have a short list here, um, in infancy and childhood, attention, motor, intellectual disorders, neurodevelopmental developmental problems, digestive issues. In adulthood, it's related to, in addition to the, the behavioral outcomes, also hypertension, kidney issues. So it's got a wide range of negative impacts. Um, there is some linking between um, being exposed to lead and later criminal criminality. So involvement in, um, in behaviors that could end someone up in the, the court system. Um, one thing, again, to remember about this legacy pollutant is that the people who are most likely to be exposed are poor and ethnic minority. So poor and black or brown. Um, the other thing that we are known for in Wisconsin is our ability to incarcerate people of color. Um, I do believe we're number one um, in our ability to incarcerate people of color. And so um, our, um, uh, our rate is two times the national average. And so even though uh, African Americans make up a little under 7%, of the Wisconsin state population, African American to non-Hispanic white incarceration is almost 11 to 1. And so we have these two, um, really a, a perfect storm of, of things going on. Um, and one of the things about our incarceration rates um, and court involvement rates in Wisconsin is that um, it's very clear from numerous studies that there are racial biases in how people are charged, um, how who ends up in um, the court system, who ends up arrested, who ends up incarcerated, who ends, and, and for how long. Um, so the rare, it is a reality that an African American can walk into a coffee shop and leave a coffee shop in handcuffs. Mm. And that happens more often than makes the news. So here we have these two things happening. We have um, kids of color, who are, and I'm speaking specifically of African Americans, but really it's people of color generally, and I don't want to leave out large swaths of our community um, uh, who are also experiencing these impacts. Um, so we have people of color who are more likely to be exposed to environmental pollutants in the life, and people of color who are more likely to end up in the court system. Um, for whatever reason. And I thought about these two things and also um, uh, our, our knowledge about how lead is uh, related to sort of creating a cascade of events that can have someone end up being in the court system. It led me to this question. Um, so do lead and race ethnicity interact? Does one modify the impact of the other? Um, and so um, I 
have the following research question. These data are hot off the presses. Um, this has been a project that's been literally maybe three or four years in the making, and so I'm really happy to be able to talk about this. Um, so the analysis that I'm working on right now is for felony, misdemeanor, and criminal traffic cases. Today, just for the sake of time, I'm going to stay with felony, although the criminal uh, traffic and misdemeanor cases are fascinating um, because the directions are slightly different. Hmm. Um, so how did we do this? So the Stel is everybody familiar with the Stellar database? It's the systematic tracking of Eller. Uh, elevated lead levels. <laughs> elevated <laughs> lead levels and remediation. And remediation. <laughs> Thank you. I forget all the time. and I exist in sort of an alphabet soup. And CCAP, or WCCA, which is the Wisconsin Circuit Court Access Data, which we know as CCAP. That's when people kind of stalk each other online to see who's got a court record or who's got a court case. Um, it's officially uh, called the WCCA, but most of us vernacularly know it as CCAP. Um, Stellar is protected health data um, maintained by the Public Health Department, and CCAP is publicly available data. And so what we were able to do was to combine um, CCAP data and Stellar data. Um, and that was an extraordinarily long process that I'll talk about a different day. Um, and through uh, uh, joining the databases, one thing we did was to make sure to have only cases where they had all venous le uh, lead levels as opposed to capillary. Um, just to get a little bit inside baseball on that is that the capillary test, it's like this finger stick, um, they're okay for screening, but they're somewhat unreliable. And so the best test is um, the, the venous test. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an idea of the sample. Um, so I examined these data um, in two groups, people, persons of color, people of color, and then non-Hispanic whites. Um, just at this initial stage of the analysis. I do want to point out that um, really my uh, people of color group is 64% uh, African American. So there is a uniqueness to the story of being black in Wisconsin. Um, so we match these data, so keeping in mind that that means that um, first we had stellar data and then we were able to connect CCAP data to the stellar data. So we don't have data for people who aren't in both of those samples. Um, so it's mostly, um, uh, so people of color, the, the sample is 71% people of color, 27.5% non-Hispanic white. That's telling in and of itself, again, right. keeping in mind that the, what this, this data set looks like. Um, and so uh, we have our cutoff of five micrograms per deciliter, so this is as being unexposed, which is just sort of our, our clinical level now that people are using, or greater than five. Um, and I can go into these in detail later. So uh, to, to whiz through this really quickly, um, ran logistic regressions and to examine the odds ratios. And sorry, this came up a little funny. Um, but the take-home message here, that people, uh, people of color um, have a uh, uh, adjusted odds ratio of 1.67 of having a felony case, just regardless of lead. If you have an elevated lead level, I have a pointer here, I forgot about that. Mm -hmm. If you have an elevated lead level, um, then you have a, an adjusted odds ratio of 1.41 of having a felony case in, um, in the stellar CCAP data. So uh, one part that I skipped over is that the lead data were collected. Um, but, um, these data are from 1994, I'm sorry, 1996 to 1998. And then we collected the data again, the, the CCAP data, or the WCCA data, when they were over the age of 18. So this is early childhood and then adult, um, involvement in the adult court system. So we looked at this um, in terms of effect modification. And so uh, using as our reference group non-Hispanic whites who have not been a, who don't have an elevated lead level. If you are a person of color in the state of Wisconsin who had an elevated blood lead level, your odds, adjusted odds ratio is 2.23 for having a felony in the CCAP 
um, as an adult in the CCAP database. If you are a person of color without uh, an elevated blood level, your, um, your odds ratio is still high compared to your reference group, the reference group, um, but not nearly as high. And then if you are non-Hispanic white with an elevated blood lead level um, as a child, there is no impact on the presence or absence of a felony case in CCAP. So, what does this mean? Um, so there are lots of things going on here. Uh, one thing to note, I don't have a lot of, uh, uh, because of the nature of the data, I don't have a lot of covariates. Although sometimes I think we covary out the story. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that, you know, I think that a lot of, or we're losing a lot of interesting things that we should be talking about in our covariates. So one of the things that has struck me is the issue of timing that we weren't able to get. So I just have, um, when I looked at age of first test as one of the covariates, um, that doesn't mean age of first exposure to lead. That's just the first time they're tested. So those exposures could be earlier. Um, they could be also at a higher dose. And um, one thing I don't know at this point is the interaction between timing and dosage. And so that's something that's going to need to come down the line. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that also we there are intergenerational impacts as well. So there's this issue of if my, I have, because of hypersegregation, lived in my, my family for generations in an area where exposure to chemicals our exposure to lead is um, pervasive, then I've been exposed. And so whatever changes happen to me um, also somehow may impact my child, who then is also exposed. So it's a really complicated story that these data are just starting to help me get a, a, a handle on. Um, and so those are some explanations there. But then there's this real societal explanation as well. Um, so our uh, people of color, even though this is this entire sample, by nature of being both in Stellar and in CCAP, is a high-risk sample. But even within what we call our, our groups of people who are living at high risk, there's variability within there, and that's how, why I see some of the racial differences that came through in the analyses. So among our uh, people of color in the state, there are a lot of things that can account for what I'm seeing in terms of the results. First of all, um, poverty. 11% of the state population uh, of the state of Wisconsin lived in poverty um, in 2016. Poverty impacted 8% of non-Hispanic whites, um, but 24% of African Americans, um, I'm sorry, 31% of African Americans, 24% of people called other, uh, categorized as other, and 16% of Hispanic Latinos Keeping in mind that African Americans and Hispanic and or Latinos make up less than 70% of the population. So poverty is a big driver here. Um, also, uh, differences in the quality of health care um, can also contribute to some of the findings that I'm seeing. Um, differences in arrest and sentencing. Um, and differences, honestly, in how people, you know, I have the, the cartoon, drop the weapon. In, uh, of a baby holding a rattle, um, but we also know that there is actually a crisis of African-American children getting kicked out of preschool. So these are sort of self-perpetuating injustices that build up and can impact how um, children um, go on to end up in the court system. And then, I'm sorry, last thing here, um, also just the issue of uh, differential treatment by the courts is something to keep in mind. Um, the data is relatively consistent, that people of color um, are uh, adjudicated into more serious cases and um, receive harsher sentences than non-Hispanic whites. And the note that I'll tell you about um, uh, criminal traffic and misdemeanor cases is that if you have elevated lead and are a person of color in this sample, you are less likely to have a criminal traffic case or a misdemeanor, which kind of blows my mind. Um, but if I think about it, what I think might be happening is that you add to that, and if you are if you are African or if you're a person of color, you are less likely overall to have a um, misdemeanor or criminal traffic. I suspect that's an indication of people being overcharged. 
So an indication of being overcharged is quite possibly an indication of regionality um, and an ability to have a car versus accessing mm -hmm. other forms of transportation. So um, really what uh, this, this question that I'm at is how do we get from early experiences to uh, these lost opportunities? And so this is a model that I really started out with to think about how do you get from being a baby to this prison pipeline. And um, really what I think is happening is a multiple, multitude of things. Those social risks and inequities, both the chemical and non-chemical stressors, and keeping in mind that I'm only examining one stressor. Um, and that's one of the things that tends to be an issue is that we, we study one stressor at a time when they really all work together in one way or another. Um, and so just the concluding thought from this part of the analysis is that race-based social and, and health inequities perpetuate racial inequality. If I were to say that that is the take-home message of this particular analysis. Now, there are things that we continue to need to do. For example, look at the key covariates, timing of exposure, um, also uh, access to interventions, um, and really this idea of multiple exposures as well. So thank you. And I do want to give a specific and particular shout out to my student, Amy Taub, who spent about a year and a half connecting those data sets mm -hmm. and crashing my computer <laughs> multiple times because there was one point where we had four or five million unique cases and so she was really amazing. But anyway, thank you. Thank you, Tanine. And I recommend that you check out Dr. Bart Dilworth Bart's um, bio on her webpage that has a longer piece about the philosophy that frames this work, which includes a really lovely piece about Eyes on the Prize, which is um, derived from a spiritual that was prominent and influential in the civil rights era. And I think it's important for us, you know, to kind of interject here as we hear what sounds like a really gloomy it picture that um, first we need awareness and then we need to take action. And we've already heard some hints of what those actions can be. Um, and I really appreciate the light of awareness shining on the problems that we face um, and also the great strengths that we have here among these scholars and clinicians. So Kristen Malucky is an assistant professor in the Department of Population Health Sciences here at UW-Madison. She has a doctorate in environmental epidemiology and health policy and a master's of public health from Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health. She serves as the co-director for the Survey of the Health of Wisconsin, overseeing survey implementation efforts and ancillary study development, and she's been a leader in the development and evaluation of indicators for environmental health risk assessment and policy. Um, before coming to the UW, she served as the lead epidemiologist for the state environmental public health tracking program, and her current research is focused on developing models to examine combined chemical, physical, and social stressors and their influence on adult chronic disease, childhood development, and obesity. Thanks. Hey, thank you. Thanks, it really is an honor for me to be here, and we... Um, I'm going to skip through a lot of what I have to say. So I just was going to go back a little bit big picture and talk about environmental justice and health equity, but I don't know that I have to do much because I think Janine did a fantastic job on that. So, um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about cumulative risk and then think a little bit about moving forward. So what are environmental health equity? So we're here to talk about discussion. We'll focus a little bit on environmental justice. And here... Um, this is a quote by Dr. Robert Bouillard, who's done a lot within um, informing environmental justice work and policy at the US EPA. And he said, whether by conscious design or institutional neglect, communities of color in urban ghettos and rural poverty pockets or on economically impoverished Native American reservations face some of the worst environmental devastation. In the <coughs> and so we've seen two examples of that. So there's gastroschisis in our rural communities, and then we have lead in our cities. Um, and this is grounded in the his history of how our nation started with the chem as the chemical boom happened. We had communities that were placed right next to large toxic waste sites. So this is like now. Um, I'll go through that a little bit. We know that amongst the most affected by environmental factors across the world, this is um, data from the World Health Organization, children under five are the most affected. 
And these data, I'm showing these data. This is a map over here. This is New York City, for those of you who are not from there. And I got interested in this whole topic because I went to school at NYU and I was thinking about doing a project. And what I saw is I started to look at rates of disease in the population. And over here are the hospitaliz asthma hospitalization rates per 1,000 children in 2010. And I was working with a community-based group up here in the South Bronx. The rates of asthma in this community are 8 to 10 times the national average. Um, and what this map is, which is almost exactly parallel, is the percent of residents who rated conditions of residential structures fair or poor. So what we see is we see the strong correlation between neighborhoods, characteristics, and the places that we live, and adverse health outcomes. And we also know from the world of psychology, and so we've got two psychologists here on the panel, <laughs> that the number of risks that children face if you're in middle income is much fewer. So sometimes if we're middle income, high income, we have one or two risks that are happening in our lives. But those dramatically decline. But children in poverty tend to have much higher rates of risk compared to others. And these risks have to do with family turmoil, community violence, early ch childhood separation. None of this really says air pollution or lead. So, but we do know that from those studies is your risk of dying, if you have four or more of these risks, you have a, your survival, your overall survival is much lower with four or more risks than if you're higher. And this is for cardiovascular risk, but we could talk about lots of other factors. And this is, then I went on to graduate school, so that was when I was an undergrad, right? And I'm like, well, these are big problems, we're going to solve them, right? And I got to grad school, and this is what people started telling me. There's things in the chemical environment, and they're going to impact health. I'm like, okay, that's good. <laughs> but it's really much more complicated than that, right? We know that it's not just this linear thing that's happening, and we saw many examples of this. And so what we do when we regulate risk is we regulate at this average population response. So one of the problems is we're never taking into account these susceptible subgroups. So children are one of those susceptible subgroups. And what happens is that if you regulate at the mean, you set standards here to protect the average population. So if we say we want an IQ loss no greater than two amongst the population, these are made up data. But this is related to lead and air pollution, for example. And I'm going to go fast because I think Sherry's got more interesting things to say. No. But um, <laughs> so if we regulate here at the average, right? What happens if we have a more sensitive group? That group is unprotected by those regulations. So it's just another iteration on the theme. And we saw this. We know kids are more vulnerable, and we know that because they're developing rapidly. And we know that people are exposed to chemicals every day, everywhere, everyone. So that we know that, and then we know that there are people who are trying to change what we're doing. So this is called science and decisions advancing risk assessment. So while we may be going, um, we're not heading there now, we were um, making progress towards thinking about environmental health and policies towards improving environmental health in this cumulative risk paradigm. And we know that in environmental health, this is by um, Devin Payne Sturgis, who's now, I think, at the University of Maryland. Um, but when she did this, she was at the US EPA. And what she was really pointing out is that we have both community-level vulnerability and individual vulnerability. And again, we saw most of that, and that has to do with stressors. So this is what the world really looks like, right? So that old framework wasn't right. This is what it really looked like. But how do we have the data to show the world that we this really is happening, right? It's complicated. So those of you who are academics, a linear line is what we really want, but um, the reality is a little bit messier. So I got really excited about the survey of the Health of Wisconsin project, and I'm happy to talk to anybody about that a little bit more. We get a representative sample of state residents throughout the state. We started in 2008, and we've been traveling all over the state and collecting data. <laughs> and we've gone everywhere in the state. Um, and then a little bit of context. This is Milwaukee. This is where I grew up in Milwaukee. This is a mile from where I grew up in Milwaukee. And this is another part of Milwaukee that has a lot of protective factors and assets that go along with it. And so I say this. I used to just do these past two slides. But I think it's really important to say that we have the power to change communities. And this is part of our conversation that's going to be happening. And a lot of that has to do with these protective factors. So this is right in the heart of the city of Milwaukee. This is the Urban Ecology Center. We've got great neighborhoods, these places for people to gather, places for kids to play, um, and so we can talk about that. But with the show data, I wanted to look at air pollution. I wanted to look at air pollution because I didn't have any lead data, I didn't have other things. Um, and I wanted to look at both how neighborhood characteristics modify the association between chronic air pollution and cardiopulmonary health, 
But I also knew that Milwaukee was an incredibly segregated city because I grew up there. I lived there, I grew up there, and I knew that there were issues there. And so I wanted to see how did that impact this issue of vulnerability. And when I say vulnerability, I'm talking about your increased potential for exposure. So that's what Janine was talking about, right? We know that air pollution is place-based. We know it's related to a lot of different things. Um, we also are increasingly seeing it being related to neurodevelopment, which is related to a project that Janine and I are working on. And we also know that biological stress and air pollution influence exactly the same biological pathways and mechanisms. So stress it, um, influences your immune function, your metabolic dysregulation, which leads to cardiovascular disease, obesity, cancer, cognitive decline, and aging. So stress and air pollution, biologically, it would make sense that they might interact. This is what the air pollution levels look across the state of Wisconsin. These are the cohort participants that we have. And then I looked at the data and I said, well, what happens? Do we see, Wisconsin, by the way, is in compliance most often for air pollution. So we have relatively low levels of air pollution. We see 12 micrograms per meter cubed on average, um, or 10 or 11 actually. China sees levels in the 75 on a daily basis. So we're really low. We're doing well with air pollution. And yet, we see that the general population, there's a slight reduction in lung function. This is no effect. For people who live in communities where they perceive it to be well-maintained, again, you see very little effect. But if you live in a neighborhood where you perceive it to be not well-maintained, you have a strong negative association with air pollution. So this is looking at fine particulate matter on measured lung function that we measure in show. So these are people breathing into a tube. Um, and then we have this, also have this issue of extreme racial segregation. Um, and so these are block groups where you can see upwards of 70, 80, 90 percent. This is also uh, much on many of these individuals also are lower income. And when I looked at the data, I also saw that amongst individuals who are people of color compared to, again, to this non-Hispanic white group, that amongst that, individuals who self-identify as black in our survey, 98% of them um, live in an area that's greater than 10 micrograms per meter cubed, which is the World Health Organization health-based standard for air pollution exposure. So the models that I have that I just showed you, the previous model, didn't adjust for race, because in my mind, adjusting for race was also adjusting for exposure. So I didn't do that, and it doesn't matter, but what you can see is that we have communities in Wisconsin that are much more vulnerable. They're much more likely to be exposed because of where they live. And then we can also see that, similar to the, we can see much stronger adverse effects of air pollution on health when we stratify by um, self-identified race in the population. So what's going on? It's complicated. There's lots happening here. But I want to get to this. The thing is about it is that we know that environmental disease <coughs> burden is preventable. This you guys can hopefully they'll hand out the slides. We know that a one dollar investment in things like um, can lead to seventy one dollar savings. This is a, a indoor air intervention that was done in Connecticut. Um, and Sherry's going to talk about that a little bit more. And it also says that in order for us to address these complexities, we need both to address the community factors and the family and individual level factors that we have. And we really need to address this health equity, um, environmental as one of the major issues of health equity and determinants, and that we need to be thinking more broadly, that it's living and working conditions that influence all of these different factors. And we need to be, um, I'm an epidemiologist, but we need to have a focus more towards consequential epidemiology, hmm. which means that we're not only studying the disease and the distribution of determinants in the population, but we're actually applying that to the study and control of disease, which in the end will help us to maximize health outcomes and benefits. So, and leads to action. So there's lots of people to thank, but I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Sherry Johnson, who's dedicated her 25 plus year career to partnering with children, families, community organizations, and systems to advance health and well being. Um, awed by the resilience of individuals and communities, she shared that she's motivated to remove unfair obstacles and conditions that create and perpetuate health inequity. She completed her undergraduate studies at Brown University, earned a master's and PhD in clinical psychology at Boston University, and served as a clinical fellow in psychology at Harvard Medical School. She's 
she was previously the Director of Behavioral Health at Milwaukee Health Services, a federally qualified health center, and served as the Administrator and State Health Officer for the Wisconsin Division of Public Health. Just prior to joining us here recently at UW-Madison as the new Director of the Population Health Institute, she was Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the Medical College of Wisconsin in the Center for Advancement of Underserved Children, where she collaborated with diverse stakeholders to address a broad range of real-world problems. Thank you. That was super long. So. happy to bring up the rear and maybe also bring some um, hope to what we can do <laughs> to prevent exposures in our children and families. And I see uh, my colleague and friend, Steve Ventura, and co-investigator on this work that I'm going to present. So I just want to recognize him and also say that those of you from Pop Health heard this when I did my job talk, but um, <laughs> bear with me. So um, this is, I am a pracademic, so I am really interested in taking the thousand years of research that Janine talked about around lead and doing something about it. Um, so we are really focused with a range of partners on taking what we know about um, the dangers of exposure to lead and really doing primary prevention. So we partnered with 16th Street Community Health Center, Walnut Way Conservation Corps, Soils Department here at UW, UW Extension, the Milwaukee Health Department, and the Medical College of Wisconsin to actually try to um, remove lead from the environment and help uh, working alongside with neighborhood residents um, people to uh, have an environment that's free from exposure to toxins. So what I'm going to try to cover today, and if there's a timekeeper, just wink at me when I'm done, is to describe this partnership between community residents and community-based organizations, academics and governmental organizations that's focused on primary prevention of lead, talk about some challenges and successes that we've had in translating this very um, rich research into action at the community level, and then talk about some policy advocacy targets that we're um, honing in on for year five. So as you've heard already, lead is well known to be a neurotoxin. There's no safe level of exposure for children, and the impacts on development across the life course have been established and are really negative. Um, the angle that we've taken, though, is that, okay, we know lead is bad, uh, but we also know that people are trying to do some things to improve their health. So this individual level and community level um, action to promote health is alive and well in Milwaukee and other cities, and in particular around urban agriculture. So people are wanting to have access to healthy food, they're wanting to spend time with children and families and to um, provide sort of legacy education around nature and the environment. And yet, um, there are potentially some increased health risks because of legacy soil contamination that makes this um, push toward uh, urban agriculture potentially dangerous. So we started to do this work because people in Milwaukee and community-based organizations were promoting backyard gardening as a transformational community development strategy, but simultaneously recognizing that there might be some unintended consequences around increased risk of exposure to toxins. Um, we know that in Milwaukee, uh, lead is already a big problem. So long before Flint, Milwaukee and lots of other cities around the state had high levels of elevated blood um, in our children. So 8.6% of people, kids in the city of Milwaukee um, were testing uh, above 5 micrograms per deciliter, deciliter. But it's not just a Milwaukee problem. So we, we really want to be able to take the lessons that we're learning in Milwaukee and apply them elsewhere. Um, but what you can see here is that there is a concentration effect, as others have talked about. So in those darker pink uh, squares, those are central city neighborhoods that are largely populated by African American and Hispanic people. And that's um, actually reflected when we drill down even to census tracts that are um, served by the community-based organizations 16th Street and Walnut Way that we see that in those census tracts that are served by the two community-based organizations, there are extremely high rates of uh, children who have been poisoned. So 10% um, down to 8% in 2012. So um, we had some pilot work where we collected some small uh, data around uh, what people were doing in terms of backyard gardening, um, how interested they might be in learning about the level of soil contamination and what else they would want to do once they learned or if they learned that their soil was contaminated. And that led us to really focus on a primary prevention strategy, that it wouldn't be enough to just educate people about 
um, the behaviors that they could engage in as individuals to reduce their risk of exposure. But neighbors really told us, and it was confirmed also by the CDC, that primary prevention is really what we have to do. We have to get let out of the environment. And we actually know a lot about how to do that. It's really sort of an absence of, of will. <laughs> um, so we formed this bigger partnership that includes lots of people that I won't tell you about in this slide, um, but a complex problem requires a complex set of partnerships and a complex set of players to get at more than just a health behavior individual level responsibility solution. And so we've engaged the health department, um, we've engaged the extension program at the um, county, and we've engaged policy makers um, at the DNR, um, and other experts who are advocates to try to help us tackle the so, uh, tackle the problem from a multi-level solution. Um, so our project is funded by the Healthier Wisconsin Partnership Program. I was a principal investigator until I came here, and now Dr. Byer is. And we had three aims. So we did focus on an individual level and community level expansion of environmental health literacy um, around soil contamination and access to soil testing. We wanted to do that primary prevention, though, get soil um, uh, to be in better condition so that people can continue to engage in backyard gardening and get the benefits of it, and then really start the thinking about what are the policy changes that are necessary if we're going to make sustainable, long-lasting change. I'm talking super fast, so tell me if I'm talking too fast. <laughs> um, uh, and our goals were to engage 425 participants in workshops around uh, environmental health literacy, to engage between 70 and 95 households in these two geographically defined neighborhoods to do soil testing and to actually landscape, do interventions at, on their landscape, and then to do the policy analysis. And um, the methods that we've been using, we've been doing pre-post knowledge surveys and also surveys around attitudes and uh, behavior, and then have employed um, two types of soil um, testing. So the traditional XRF methodology, which uses sort of this little machine, and you go around and zap the soil, and you get one reading. But through our collaboration with um, the UW Soil Science Department, we were able to also have the health department learn a new methodology called Malik 3, which does a couple of things. It allows neighbors to understand both the nutrient content of their soil as well as the toxic exposure. So in our participatory approach, neighbors said, yes, we want to know what's out there that's bad, but we also want to know if our soil is good for growing things because we want to be in our backyards growing things and making, uh, improving our access to healthy soil. So through this collaboration, the health department actually learned a new method, and made available this new information to neighbors in, the, in, in Milwaukee. And then the third important part about Malik 3 is it's not um, a method that is regulated by the DNR. And so the results of it, and we'll talk a little bit about that if we have time, don't uh, send off a set of alarms around reporting that would otherwise have potentially stood in the way of people deciding whether or not to test their soil. And then on the intervention side, uh, we're doing this pre-post testing, so prior to uh, getting an intervention, we test your soil, and then we've got a 12-month and a 24-month follow-up with both methods, um, a gardening practices interview, and then a neighborhood assessment to get at, again, these issues of what is the, the surrounding community like in terms of uh, how well our properties kept up, what's the... Um, the, the possibility of redeposition from your neighbor's house that may not have had the opportunity to keep the exterior paint in good condition. So you might have fixed your backyard garden, but if their house has peeling flakes paint, it's going to get in your garden, and there's evidence that that's happened in other communities, in Roxbury in particular. So what we do is we hold these workshops, and the, uh, I think one of the most unique and fun parts of this project is as someone else has said, Milwaukee is hyper Two people live in Milwaukee is hyper-segregated, as you know. African Americans primarily on the north side, Latinos on the south side, and then um, primarily European Americans in the suburbs. This project is probably one of the first and only projects that brings together two neighborhoods. So the north side neighborhoods, the Lindsay Heights neighborhood, Walnut Way serves a predominantly African American community, 16th Street serves a predominantly Latino neighborhood, and we do these workshops in both neighborhoods, in Spanish and in English, and importantly, we bring the neighbors together as part of the participatory research approach, and they actually get together in each other's neighborhoods to help us plan the interventions and look at the data, interpret the data, and help us chart the course forward. So it's really been a unique opportunity for us to learn with and 
from each other and to literally bridge the gap because there is a literal bridge between the north side and the south side in Milwaukee. So the, the education is, 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 is really health behavior oriented. What can people do in their day-to-day -day life to reduce the risk of lead exposure? Um, and then we get into specific, how do they test their soil um, and where can they get their soil tested? So as of January of this year, we've had 27 two-hour workshops. We've had 200 and almost 50 adults and almost 200 kids participate in these two-hour workshops, which you know, for me is, is a surprise. So a lot of times we hear, oh, people of color and low-income people don't really want to participate in their own health. You know, nobody can get people to come. And here we've got 250 adults who come out either at 6 o'clock at night or 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning with their family because they want to be engaged in backyard gardening, they want to do it safely, um, and they are enthusiastically involved not only in the intervention, but a large percentage are willing to participate in research. And that's largely because of the participatory approach that we've used, that we use not only trusted people in community-based organizations who either live, work, and play near and with um, the residents, but because we actually have the residents sitting around the table with us as academics, with the DNR, with the city policy, um, the, the mayor's uh, policy leader, and they are equal partners in those conversations. So what are we finding? So this is, um, this is all still on a roll right now, so we're about to start the next season of workshops, so the data is not all in. Um, but some of the interesting findings so far are that the people that have participated in the workshop of huge proportion of them are interested in getting their soil tested. However, that same large proportion had no idea before the project where to get their soil tested, and most had never had their soil tested prior to the project. So people were engaged in backyard gardening, but really had no information about the level of potential risk or how they might even learn about the risk. Um, we have been interested in equity also from the very beginning. So. Uh, we wanted to make sure that both people who owned their own property as well as people who rented their property could participate in the study. There's a whole other PowerPoint about the ethical issues related to that and IRB and consenting processes. Um, but we are seeing some differences uh, in terms of owners and renters in terms of who's um, feeling uh, that they can bring their soil in for testing without potential repercussions. And so this slide shows you that um, people are telling us that they want to know if there's lead in their soil. I don't know how to use the pointer. So about 43% of people want to know if there's lead in their soil. And about almost a quarter also think that that knowledge is going to help them um, and their whole community as well. But we also know that about 20% of the respondents said that they would possibly not get their soil tested because they think their landlord wouldn't like it. So we really have to continuously pay attention to equity when we're doing these um, types of projects to make sure that we're not actually widening that disparities by bringing access to, you know, to soil testing for people who own their property and leaving the most vulnerable people, the lower income people who are renters, uh, farther behind in the equation. Um, so what are we finding so far in terms of soil? So the DNR has set a background level of 52 parts per million as the level at which uh, people who test their soil need to report to the DNR. And so we've used that as our um, baseline for eligibility for an intervention. Um, but in the next slide, I'll show you what the US EPA has in terms of uh, safe gardening practices. So, so far, baseline soil samples just using the XRF, which is doesn't give us a measure of bioavailability, but gives us a total lead count. We've got a minimum of 16 and a maximum of 2,539 parts per million of lead in backyard soil. Um, so um, that's pretty toxic. <laughs> and about 87% of the samples that we've collected so far are above that DNR threshold. And the DNR has set these thresholds. Um, so zero to 400 parts per million they suggest is um, okay to garden in. 400 to 1,200, they recommend using precautions, and then anything above 1,200, do not garden there, cover it with grass. So if you go back to the previous slide, um, you can think about those people that are getting the very high readings and almost twice as high as, as what's considered safe. But what's interesting here is that pretty much a third of the uh, results so far are showing us that uh, precautions need to be used. So in addition to the environmental health literacy about what individual behaviors people can take, those are really the people where we want to help focus on uh, primary prevention. 
So the, the interventions, I don't have a slide, include blue skies landscaping. So again, from a multi-level focus, we don't want to just come in and solve a problem for an individual or community. We want to build capacity. So Walnut Way operates something called blue skies landscaping. So this is a, a for-profit um, entrepreneurial uh, endeavor that Walnut Way started, and it employs <coughs> men primarily, but women can do it too, from the community in a landscaping company. So they actually go out and do the interventions that are based on the level of soil contamination at each property. Um, so it's, it's a job creation and a job development strategy that we've incorporated into the project. So last, I'll just cover where we are in terms of policy. So what we learned in some of this data is that people want to know um, whether their soil is safe or not. Um, they want to know whether they're going to be legally or financially responsible um, if their soil is contaminated. They want to know whether their home is going to lose value because there are residential property transfer laws that if you have lead on your property, you're required to report it when you sell it. Um, and they want to know where to go for help. Um, this has led us... Uh, I'm going to skip um, to, after lots of conversations with neighborhood residents and policymakers, um, to an advocacy agenda that's going to culminate in a summit this um, fall. And so far, this is where we're at. We want to create a soil testing friendly environment. So we want everybody in the city of Milwaukee to be able to test their soil if they want to at an affordable price and to be able to understand what the results are. So that, you know, that that's a whole 10 years worth of work right there. Um, but we have had some success, so the health department has now opened up um, soil testing capacity to every run around the state, actually. So you can now grab a bag of soil, send it to the Milwaukee Health Department, and for uh, $25 you can get both nutrient and lead content with an explanatory letter that we worked with the extension staff um, to make it visually understandable and hopefully at a level of literacy that most people can make use of. Um, we want to make sure that then this cost-effective testing is publicly accessible, and so the next step is really a broader marketing campaign um, so that people know that this is available. We want people to have access to low-cost soil interventions. So through these um, interventions, and we're just now getting some of the data in around whether these interventions are working, and we're we're pleased to see that most of the properties that have had more than one intervention have had a reduction in the soil lake concentration from anywhere between 200 to 400 parts per million. But we have seen some interesting sort of nonlinear relationships between the initial baseline and 24-month test that we can talk about. Um, so we're thinking now about what would it look like to have low-cost soil intervention and training that's publicly accessible and funding that's available for this ongoing safeguarding education. Um, and then broadly, we want to increase policymakers' awareness of lead in soil, which is part of a very sort of complex um, uh, multiple exposure uh, challenge that we're having in Milwaukee. Because as we stood up the work around lead in soil, Flint occurred, and then the water crisis in Milwaukee un uh, was uncovered. So we have about 70,000 homes in Milwaukee that have um, lead laterals, and there is a, a tremendous now amount of galvanization of people in the community around uh, making sure that, pe that especially children and women of reproductive age are having access to safe water. And so that's a plus in some ways that there's increased attention, but it's also a challenge because people have difficulty understanding multiple exposure pathways, and there isn't a lot of exact science around which one is more important to focus on and why and what are the cost savings involved. Um, and simultaneously, we've got another context of policy that is headed in a different direction. So the US EPA is considering repealing, for example, the lead safe certified renovation contractor law that requires people that are doing home repairs to be trained to do it in a lead safe way. And I'll just end on this story that um, in our, in our study, we had a, a family that had a baseline test. It was high. We went in and did the intervention based on the level of uh, soil contamination. Came back 12 months later. It had actually gone up. So, of course, we wanted to know, uh-oh, something's wrong. We're not doing something right. Community-based organization staff went out and talked with the family and learned that they had had their porch resanded and repainted and that they had used a neighborhood contractor to do it. Um, and we discovered that that was likely the cause for this 
increase in soil contamination. So the story could end there, but because of the, the deep relational work that we're doing, the community-based organization staff said to the neighbors, if you can give me the name of that contractor, we can actually hook him or her up with access to lead safe contractor training because this is a person who's going to be doing this renovation work all through the community, and if they want to get trained to do it more safely, we can help them with it. That person actually did wind up going and getting um, the training and is now going to be able to do work for neighbors in that geographical area in a much safer way. But if this kind of policy gets um, turned back, that will no longer be a requirement. 